I really want to thank Yasmin for inviting me. When I got the email back in October about from uh, Marcus Oldham and, and Yasmin Chalmers, and I'm going, okay, I don't know who this is. And I got down to the line where she'd like me to have to come, come. She'd like me to come to Australia, and I hit return yes before I even. It didn't matter what. <laughs> this is this is my sixth trip to, to Australia, um, and any opportunity I get, I will come. You know. Oh, we have to dig ditches. I don't care. Just bring me here. So I, I'm very pleased to be here. And um, I hopefully go, folks get past my California, Texas, American accent. So it'll be OK. Uh, I, as I will tell you as I go through this, my goal in, in life is to uh, in, uh, promote, produce and promote beef that's high in oleic acid, which goes hand in hand with marbling. This is a uh, picture from Korea. I was in 2009. Uh, I was there giving a, a talk, and some journalists pulled me off to the side, and they said, you know, can, can you tell us about your research? And, and they wanted me to promote their, their piece of beef, and they said, well, would, would you give me a thumbs up over some Hanu beef? And I said, well, sure. Um, the thing is, that's plastic, so I'm promoting plastic beef. So <laughs> that wasn't a real piece of beef. But anyway, I thought that was kind of fun. Uh, I was enjoying myself. So what I'm going to talk about, just briefly, a little bit about production, but most, uh, also about the health and a little bit about the chemistry. Uh, cat, uh, I've worked for years since Japan opened up its market to American beef in the very early 90s, well, 1991. I've worked with Japanese black cattle, the American Akaushi, um, the red cattle, American Australian Wagyu. And when I say Japanese black, I specifically mean cattle from Japan and uh, the Korean Hanu and the Chinese yellow cattle, these cattle all share the same genetics. And they're, they're, they have a very different fatty acid composition. So that really sparked an interest in me. When we got our first samples from Japan, I thought, this is amazing. And then also, that the research has indicated that if we corn feed our cattle, uh, specifically corn gives us the best results, we get beef that's high in oleic acid, and I'll explain what that is. And I'm going to touch base on the brisket, has, happens to be very high, high in oleic acid. So I'll just be real here. Uh, my entire universe uh, is, you know, I'm kind of a one-trick pony. And it's, uh, yeah, it's an equine group. OK. Uh, it, oleic acid um, is uh, very important for flavor. Some wonderful research has just recently come out of the uh, University of Melbourne. Uh, it's important for juiciness. I'll explain why. And it goes hand in hand with marbling. If you increase marbling with, in cattle, you get more oleic acid. So first thing I want to do is give a really brief introduction to um, the beef cattle production in the United States, just to give you an idea how, how actually similar it is to the way Australians are raising cattle now that you have a very well-developed feedlot system. Uh, we start with calves. Uh, my father-in-law ran a cow-calf operation and so that uh, he raised a Angus, uh, he had Angus cows, and, and then, uh, he would take the calves about eight months of age, take them to the sale barn. And most of the people there buying the cows would be, unless they were heifers, uh, then local farmers would pick them up. But they, they would take those calves, and somewhere between six and eight months of age, take them to uh, 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 background them on pasture. So the reality is, as we talk, I'll talk about grass-fed and grain-fed cattle, all of our cattle are grass-fed uh, typically till about uh, 12 months of age, unless there's no pasture, unless we have a drought. And then uh, if they can afford to, they'll take them straight to the feedlot. Well, they'll be fed for 150 to 210 days on feed until they get to the targus and target weight or age of 13 to 18 months, depending on how soon they went on corn, uh, what kind of breed type they are. More typical, it's more typical to have them background stalkers be uh, kept on grass for th uh, pasture hay three to nine months uh, and then go back in the feedlot. And I was, uh, I had a little talk here uh, Monday morning and I was kidding them. I was saying, well, okay, well, they, they start out as, as Herefords. When they go to stalkers, they automatically change the black. And then, oh, they're back to Herefords. But anyway, the, uh, okay. Uh, after uh, they reach a weight of around 525 kilograms, and again, it, it depends on the breed type, we'll harvest those, which is a nice word for slaughtering. Um, it's politically correct, I guess. You're out there with sides, you know, cutting down the, uh, anyway. We'll fabricate those in our, our packing plants, uh, slaughterhouses. That'll go into retail sales or into food service. So I'm not, I, I'm guessing that's not very much different from the Australian system that, that includes uh, packing houses. I want to 
give a little information on um, what we do with our, our beef and the value it is to the United States, and it's a big deal. Uh, in Texas, it's second only to oil. Well, everything's second to oil in Texas. So, uh, The retail value of, of U.S. beef is now over $100 billion. And I don't have the numbers up here, but um, uh, let, me, let me see if I can get this right. It's about 90 million head of cattle that we have that be dairy, uh, cull cows, uh, steers, that's our main thing, the heifers that go into the, the meat market. The cattle, the value of the uh, cattle and the calves is right around 60 billion. And uh, now our actual consumption, uh, beef production, has flattened, so you see a huge increase in value uh, and yet fairly flat production. And that's because of our drought that we had between 2010-2013. Uh, it was serious enough that it, certainly in Texas, a lot of the producers, cow-calf operators, had to sell off their cattle. And so um, uh, then all of a sudden they became very valuable. So people who had calves to take to the auction barn were getting some serious money. It about tripled what they were getting uh, per pound. So now the main thing I wanted to show is that unlike Australia, where 70% of your production go, is for export, so you have an excellent system for exporting beef and beef parts, <coughs> less than 10% of our beef production goes overseas or across the borders to Canada or Mexico. And so it's a very small part of what we do, and it's, it's not a lot of the middle meats. It's, it is pieces and parts. It's the tongue, it's the liver, the uh, whatever parts that we Americans are too spoiled to eat. So if you look at the top export markets for U.S. beef, um, those actually, back in 2003, Japan was our leading market. Then was, we had South Korea, Mexico, and Canada. Now, I've, I've just put in a few of the countries just so this wouldn't be too cluttered. Uh, then we got some cattle that had BSE, and it absolutely shut down the market into Japan, and the Australians were quite happy about that. We were shipping in about the equal tonnage into Japan, and they quite happily filled the void. Uh, they were, it just worked really well for them, and other countries as well. And we finally are recovering from that. It's taken a long time. So again, Japan now is our leading export market, followed by Canada, Mexico, South Korea. And, but the kinds of meat we sell, sell, send to these countries is quite different. You know, uh, uh, Koreans and Mexicans really like tripe, uh, the rumen uh, in Korea. Uh, it, they make a stew, and uh, Mexico would be menudo. So, um, but again, this is only 9 to 10% of our total beef production. Uh, so I don't think we have quite the focus that we really need to on export market. If you look at um, the value of, our, uh, to our, of the major exporters in the world, and somebody asked me yesterday why I didn't include India, because uh, they don't eat their beef, they export it. But I just, I really focus the United States, Australia, and then uh, the American countries that are leading. So the value is, uh, that we get is only slightly higher than Australia, but we're pretty similar in the value for our export. And again, this is 70% of your production. For us, it's about 9 or 10%. Uh, the biggest exporter in the world, uh, included here, uh, in ex excluding India, is Brazil. And so... Uh, so it, the blue bars are amounts of export, and by far they lead in export uh, numbers. But look how low the value is. And the value is very low in Brazil because they're a grass-fed country, basically, a grass-fed industry, and they're just now starting to develop feedlots, JBS especially. So we're getting, Australia and, and uh, America, that we're getting more for our beef because it's a much, a much higher quality. So I'm going to shift over, you know, I started with oleic acid, and if you have any questions about production, then um, I'll try to answer, if I can answer those, I will. I'm not an economist, I'm just a bench scientist uh, who really likes to play with cattle, but okay. I want to talk about oleic acid just briefly, and uh, not too much chemistry, but oleic acid is a monounsaturated fatty acid because it has one double bond right in the middle, which has a huge impact on the melting point of the fatty acid. And we have other fatty acids that in much smaller amounts, like the polyunsaturated fatty acids like linoleic acid or the CLAs from the rumen, conjugated linoleic acid. But a large part, portion, because we eat so much ground beef in the States, um, hamburgers, uh, 
a large portion of the oleic acid in our diet comes from ground beef, which sounds weird because uh, uh, if you had an oil like olive oil or canola oil, you get it's much higher proportion. But we eat a lot of beef. Oops. Okay, uh, I went too far. All right. So um, I was driving back from Melbourne yesterday, and Yasmin was saying, "How can you actually convert your talk about biochemistry into something that people can really appreciate?" So this morning I was digging through the web, saying, "Okay." Um, when I talk about oleic acid, uh, olein is Latin for oil, you know, so, it, you know, you're in the Bible and they anointed David with oil. Well, it's olive oil. That's all the religion you get from me today. So, uh, okay. Um, but it, it always refers to plant oils. So they're liquids at room temperature. I found a picture of extra virgin olive oil. Oh, um, it, we, we produce ec extra virgin oleic beef. They're steers, extra virgin. Anyway. Um, stay with me here. Uh, so the, okay, so it's all, always a liquid at room temperature, and so oleic acid, linoleic acid, you can see that the olein is carried through in the names, and our alpha linolenic is a derivative of that. And the Japanese have their own characters for that. Uh, this, this would be uh, abura, which means oil. You get down to animal fat. Well, for animal fat, it, the word for that comes from the Greek. It's stearin. And I'll be talking about stearic acid, which is at, uh, one of the most abundant saturated fats in beef. It always refers to animal fats. And so the Ch uh, Japanese has, have characters. It's a shibo, and it just means animal fat. And so here you have a solid at room temperature. So, so you'd have stearic acid or steatosis, which would mean fatty liver or fatty uh, muscle. So real difference in melting point. And as it ha turns out, the, our fat cells uh, and the fat cells in livestock species actually convert stearic acid as 18 carbons, really high melting point, 70 degrees. There's an enzyme that converts it to oleic acid that has a melting point down below room temperature. And the American Akushi Association has this really cool video and they show, they cook Akushi ground beef, they pour off the oil into a little wine glass like this, and it, it is a liquid until it gets below room temperature. So, it, and it's a huge difference. If you did this with grass-fed beef, it turns hard immediately. So there's a big difference in melting points of lipids and fat cells just because of this one enzyme. Now the other thing we found out, and this is based on research in the mid-90s, it, it actually came out of work I was doing here with Cyro and uh, Cannon Hill, uh, Brisbane, outside of Brisbane. And we found out that when marbling increases, this oleic acid, this oil, actually increases in the beef. So as, as you look at percent intramuscular lipid and then oleic acid, it, it really goes up with marbling. And what, I have two lines here. The black line, uh, appropriately, is for Japanese black cattle. And the blue lines, which I think is pretty appropriate, would be US cattle, but, um, or Angus. And uh, I couldn't do red, white, and blue, but that's a bit over the top anyway. But what we found out is if you're to get more oleic acid, um, well, if, to get more marbling, you have to feed the cattle some kind of a grain. And for us, corn is king. If you want something that's really low in marbling and low in oleic acid, you feed them just pastures, grass, alfalfa, hay, you know, just native pastures. Because grass feeding really depresses the activity of that enzyme, steroquate saturase, and you can't convert the high melting point stearic acid to the low melting point oleic acid. Let's see. And now, way back um, 20 years ago, Penny Chris Hetherton from Penn State Uni University published a review of the research on human studies that looked at the effects of different kinds of fatty acids on risk factors for cardiovascular disease. And so she looked at, uh, she, in this report, this is a figure from her publication, uh, the black bar is total cholesterol and the hatch bar is LDL cholesterol, the bad guy, and then the white bar would be the good guy, HDL cholesterol. And she, she looked at a number of saturated fats, this is uh, lauric, myristic, and palmitic, and those, all of those increase total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol, but nobody mentions the fact they also increase HDL cholesterol, the good cholesterol. Trans fats are a disaster. They increase LDL and decrease HDL. But oleic acid over here, over here it decreases just if you, feed, uh, in the studies where they use just oils, it decreased LDL and increased HDL. And so we were doing research and we could say, well, we're increasing oleic acid, this, this one, does it increase, when, if you feed meat that's high in oleic acid, will that increase HDL cholesterol? What, um, what will happen? Well, uh, I guess worldwide, as in developed countries, 
cardiovascular disease is on the rise, and it's certainly been a biggie in the United States. And so atherosclerosis, this building up of plaques, is the cause of the majority of our cardiovascular events. And atherosclerosis comes from LDL cholesterol invading damaged endothelial lining of the blood vessels. So if you do something to damage your blood vessels, then the LDL cholesterol can invade that and you'll start building up plaque. If you're a healthy person with a good lifestyle, that's not going to happen, or it'll be very minimal. So, but because of the effects of LDL cholesterol relationship with cardiovascular disease, our medical doctors um, actually, rec the first thing they'll do is tell people to stop eating red meat. They say, it increases your LDL cholesterol, for which there's no evidence, and um, it, it, you'll reduce your atherosclerosis, which there's absolutely no evidence. What they don't talk about, they don't focus on HDL cholesterol, which is our natural defense for clearing the cholesterol from our blood vessels. Now, LDL cholesterols uh, and HDL are these little tiny spherical things that are bouncing around in our bloodstreams. The LDL cholesterol is produced uh, by the liver. HDL also is produced by liver and as well as small intestine. And these little particles bump into each other or bump into the blood vessels. LDL will be taken up by um, uh, extrahepatic tissues, and, and I mean, if you don't have LDL cholesterol, you don't have uh, secondary sex characteristics, which is a real bummer, you know, because our steroid hormones come from LD, the cholesterol that's in LDL cholesterol, you can't make many of the, the uh, uh, steroid hormones, um, so, like vitamin D, uh, and so LDL cholesterol is essential, that's why the liver is so good at making it, but sometimes we get too much, especially if we've done the bad things to our body. HDL cholesterol, it actually picks up the excess cholesterol from the other tissues and takes it back to the liver. So it's like this little scrubber that's out there uh, pulling the cholesterol out of your uh, circulate, out of the uh, blood vessels or other tissues and, and returning it to the liver. And then the liver decides whether or not it wants to send out more LDL cholesterol. Now this is uh, adapted from our uh, Framington study. It was based on thousands of people. And, oops, my arrow shifted down. Okay, that's okay. Um, this shows relative risk for cardiovascular disease as total cholesterol goes up. So it's, it's LDL plus HDL plus VLDL some, plus some other ones. And um, my whole line shift, I put these numbers here, but it seems to work. Uh, starting at a total cholesterol of 185 and going up to 335, if you have no other risk factors, if you're otherwise healthy, then um, even though your LDL cholesterol, total cholesterol can go from 185 up to 335, it's only a very small increase in relative risk. Um, I have an identical twin. We both have high cholesterol, and so um, and we try to stay pretty healthy. Uh, I won't tell you about things we do that's wrong, but that's okay. Um, but if you have something like hypertension, hyperglycemia, things that cause inflammation, metabolic syndrome that damages the blood vessels, then even at lower cholesterol, you have a higher relative risk. And look how the, the slope of the line is increasing. You st start getting a real risk. If you smoke, stop, because you're killing yourself, because it damages the endothelial cell lines. So even at low cholesterol, that, those LDL particles are invading it, and you're getting atherosclerosis. But the worst one is if you have low HDL, because no longer, you no longer have those little scrubbing bubbles out there pulling the cholesterol back into the liver. So low LDL, HDL cholesterol is worse than smoking. So, and um, I, it's not in the scope of this. You can increase your HDL cholesterol. I'll talk about diet, but also exercise. So I want to spend just a couple minutes here uh, talking about calf feeding and yearling feeding. We do, if corn's inexpensive, there's not good pasture, we'll, we'll take calves straight into the feedlot. If we have good pasture, it's more typical to background them till 12 months of age. And I just briefly want to talk about one little study we did where we, we corn fed some calves at eight months of age and then yearling fed for a while and, uh, on pasture and then uh, put them back on corn. And um, for the yearling fed, we had really poor pasture and we, uh, by around 10 months of age, we started to transition them to corn. And so their growth rates came back up and we, we took samples at different points. And Here's a, these are marbling fat cells within muscle fibers, and the calf at eight months of age had just tiny little marbling fat cells. By 16 months of age, th these marbling clumps were really huge. Our yearling fed at 12 months of age, they were still pretty small. When we transitioned to corn, then they started getting larger fat cells and accumulating 
more lipid and more oleic acid. Another way to look at this is uh, if you look at intramuscular lipid with age, the CAFED had a fairly uniform uh, uh, linear increase in marbling, intramuscular lipid. The marbling didn't increase in our yearling feds until they were really on full corn. And it never quite caught up. But if you look at slip point, the melting point of the lipid, you know, how much of this is a real oil? The, the, the melting point went from over body temperature at weaning and down to about 34 degrees, which is a typical a melting point for corn-fed cattle. And then that's calf-fed. The yearling-fed, they had to be on corn before the melting point would decrease. So we, we've done many, many studies. We've established that you can increase beef. We can increase beef that's high in oleic acid. And oh, about a little over 10 years ago, I, I went home. We're eating supper. My wife's a registered dietitian with a PhD in nutrition. So she never believes anything I say unless I can document it. And I said, dear, I said, we produce healthy beef. And she said, well, how do you know that? It's high in oleic acid. She said, you can't say that. I said, yeah, I can. I mean, it's high in oleic acid. You know, people with increased beef high in omega-3s, they say it's healthy. She said, you can't say it's healthy unless you do human studies. So, okay. So we, start, we started doing studies that, to a address the question, is high oleic acid beef healthier than conventional beef? <laughs> And as I was telling folks yesterday, cattle studies are easy. Human studies are a real pain. Humans don't like squeeze shoots, and our carcasses are really hard to grade. <laughs> so, and there's no market for them, you know, I'm telling you. Okay, anyway. Uh, so we've tested the effects in, in human subjects, and I'm just going to summarize a number of studies that we've done. But in the studies, we use ground beef for a number of reasons. Um, Hamburgers are universal, and so you can, I mean, I was in China for four weeks. I had a hamburger. You can tell this is China because there are chopsticks over on the side. But we eat more than 50% of our total beef intake is as ground beef because we use it in a number of recipes. It's not just hamburgers and fast food outlets because that beef comes from Australia. Anyway, um, but it's, <laughs> yeah, I know. domestically produced uh, ground beef is just used in, in so many recipes. It's inexpensive. It's flexible. But when we do the studies, we can control the amount of fat in studies. If I have ground beef, you know, if I have grass-fed cattle, they're gonna, that meat's going to be very lean. And if I compare that to corn-fed, then the fat amount's different. But if I take ground beef and fix the amount of fat in the ground beef, then I'm just testing composition and not amount of fat. So th we've uh, uh, done four studies that we initiated. Um, these have all, all, three of these have been published, the fourth one. We just got the review back from the journal. It will be published soon. And in these studies, we've used hypercholesterolemic men, normal cholesterolemic men, or normal men. And the women are going, okay, define a normal man. Um, but we have just different fat levels. We have ground beef from Wagyu and uh, con conventional fat trim. That was grass-fed and grain-fed. We had uh, the normal cholesterol, grass-fed versus grain-fed. We've worked with postmenopausal women in two different studies. So I'm going to basically summarize these four studies and show you our overall results. Uh, we did produce our own. On the second study, we actually fed out our own Angus steers. Uh, on either, the red line is for grass-fed, and the blue line was for grain-fed. It's just live weight. But, of course, grass-fed grew, grew more slowly. But we produced our own beef for these, processed it, formulated their own ground beef. This gives you an idea of the difference in composition. If you grass feed cattle, the blue bar is oleic acid, my favorite fatty acid. And as we go from grass fed, and these are some cattle fed to choice, uh, grain fed, uh, this is from another study, grain fed fed to choice, or the akaushi, the red wagyu uh, fed to super prime, oleic acid goes st up stepwise. Saturated fats, this uh, metal, middle bar, go down. Trans fats go way down. And that little yellow bar at the very top are the omega-3 fatty acids. So even in grass-fed cattle, there's just a tiny amount of omega-3s. So my stand has always been, in or beef cattle in the U.S., it, it is not a good source of omega-3 fatty acids. This is a typical study design where we'll do baseline testing. We'll feed the people uh, five, six, uh, five ground beef patties per week for either five or six weeks. So they're, they're getting a lot of ground beef as... And they can cook it however they want, as long as, and we got diet records to see what they were doing with that. There'll be a washout period in between, and then they'll transition to, you know, grass-fed versus grain-fed. Um, so it's a crossover study. Uh, we've had two experiments that had an exercise component, but I won't be talking about that. 
uh, but I just want to uh, summarize the results, and I want to stay on time. Okay, I've got to save time for my jokes, you know, it's the important stuff. Um, but summarize the results that we've seen uh, for uh, lipids and glucose, and if, if you'll bear with me, on the low, uh, because we don't always compare grass-fed and grain-fed, what I've called this is low MUFA on the left, or low oleic acid, high MUFA, high oleic acid, even though two of these studies did involve grass-fed versus grain-fed. And the first bar is triglycerides, and in the grass-fed triglycerides, it's not significant, uh, you know, that error bar so says everything, but ten, a small increase. But we, uh, we typically see that triglycerides go down with the high oleic acid ground beef. Uh, so total cholesterol, the red bar, it actually is going up for both. LDL cholesterol, the bad guy, if you will, actually didn't change at all in the uh, low oleic acid. We had a small increase in the high oleic acid. The really good guy, the blue bar, I think this blue, um, it, even on grass-fed, it goes up some, and it just goes up more with grain-fed. So I want to, I, I, don't want to sound like I'm picking on, on grass-fed. I, I fully believe that um, when the grass-fed people come up, come up and say that grass-fed beef is better for you than grain-fed, what they're saying, the message that's coming across is that beef is bad for you. So we're having a bad enough time in the industry with vegans and PETA and, and those groups. We shouldn't be arguing among, our, among ourselves which is better. Just market it and be done with it. But then we looked at VLDL and, and glucose and uh, a little bit of decrease in glucose, and with high MUFAs, uh, no change. But certainly we're seeing that they both increase HDL cholesterol. It's just that grain-fed does it better. These are some risk factor, other risk factors um, that we looked at. LDL particle size actually goes up with grass-fed, and that's a good thing. You want big <coughs> LDL particles, so that's a good thing from grass-fed. Insulin goes down with both kinds. So we're actually improving insulin sensitivity when we feed ground beef. Uh, there's some uh, inflammatory markers like uh, C-reactive protein and homocysteine. Those didn't change um, significantly. Uh, LPL, that's a, a very tiny uh, LDL particle, and that did, and it's a, and so, and uh, LDL3, those are serious risk factors that are very small, they're very invasive. They went down with our uh, grain-fed or our high move of ground beef. So uh, a lot of positives that came out of these studies. And as we look at the dietary intakes, when we feed, when we replace or put the ground beef in their diet, they typically cut back on carbohydrates, we have men and women. They increase their total fat intake because they're eating a lot of ground beef. And so this is, and this is men and women, and it's pooled over the different diets. But they increased a saturated fat and monounsaturated fats in their diet when they transitioned from their habitual diets to our ground beef diets. Another way to look at this, this is just percent energy from fat. And that red line is percent energy from carbs. And people, if they're maintaining caloric intake, they just trade up primarily carbs for fat. So if you're on a high carb diet, um, you're eating very low fat. If you're high fat diet, low carbohydrates. So when we see a reduction in triglycerides, it means that people are taking carbohydrates out of their diet. Their plasma triglycerides go down. So to finish up, what happens if, if you're in a part of the world where you, you can't feed corn, you don't have corn? You have a hard time um, coming up with a way to produce more marbling. Well, just use the brisket. We did a study some years ago just looking at the different depots on the carcass, and we looked at the, and I gave this presentation in, in uh, Korea, so if you can read Hangul, you're doing okay. But here's the brisket, chuck, flank, loin, plate, rib, round, and sirloin. And... Uh, the, uh, the ribs are highly favored in Korea, and it's, this is galbi, and so it would be used for their, their Korean barbecue. And we looked at the fatty acid composition, and this is the monounsaturated saturated fatty acid ratio. It's a measure of how much oleic acid is there. So the brisket has as much oleic acid, or as high a ratio, as the American Wagyu that's long fed. And then the stuff we use for ground beef production it has much uh, lower oleic acid, so it, our ground beef, uh, just typical ground beef, is much higher in saturated fat than the brisket. And I ask what's the molecular difference between uh, fat depots, well, that's another story. But there is a huge difference, so you can just use the brisket if you need. So there's some real positives for increasing fat in the diet. I mean, increasing fat in the diet decreases carbs, and that's gonna improve your uh, risk factors for cardiovascular disease.
it provides uh, increasing oleic acid in the beef provides greater health benefits than just uh, total fat. And what we saw is the ground beef consumption increased insulin sen sensitivity. And so that was a positive. You do have to watch your fat intake and your diets must be balanced because who orders a hamburger with a side of kale? So, all right, thank you. Thanks, Steve. Oh, don't sit down yet. You might have some questions. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> it's question, oh, yeah, time. question time. Wow. Okay. Are your heads spinning? A bit confused? I'm sure. No. Now, we've got a chance for a bit of questions. So, we've got one up here. Yes. Well, I, the first part of the question is what changes the metabolism? And, you know, why do we get more oleic acid with corn fed? This is based off rodent studies, but if you feed rodents diets that are high in carbohydrates, then the carbohydrates working through insulin strongly stimulate steroid saturase activity. So it's definitely a glucose load, insulin release, and it strongly promotes expression of the SED gene and in enzyme activity. So with corn, what we're trying to do is get enough glucose e either bypass through the rumen or provide more propionate for glucose production that would stimulate the steroid desaturase activity. So as you um, compare, uh, and pastures don't have any starch in them uh, at all, so it, the, the animals are completely dependent on, they're gonna, the major VFA for them is gonna be coming in as acetate. Uh, they will produce some propionate, that's where they get their blood glucose, but it's at lower levels. So uh, the grain feeding, all grain should provide some precursors for glucose, but for whatever reason, it seems like corn is a, the, the best uh, source, at least in, in, that we've seen. And very quickly, uh, when I worked here in, in Australia, we found that uh, fat samples from Victoria, where they were corn-fed, had way more oleic acid than, say, up in Queensland. So, and it, it was anecdotal. I mean, we didn't do a controlled study, but the one sample, we, set of samples we found with a really low melting point, really good composition, <laughs> happened to come from an area where they were fed corn. So, did that, I hope. Okay, the question is, it does say the, the marbling intramuscular fat differ between Wagyu and Angus? Yes, it does, and uh, I'm gonna be speaking to the students in kind of a little bit of a form this afternoon to actually go through the studies we've done comparing Angus and Wagyu, grass-fed and grain-fed, and even feeding Angus to the same Japanese endpoint, the composition is very different. So there is definitely genetic predisposition for that steroid-coidosaturase enzyme to be expressed at a higher level in the tissues of the Asian cattle, the Yan Bian Yellow, the Hanu, and especially the Japanese black that have been bred for that. So yes, sir, there is. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Professor. The the difference between the, the, the various feeding mechanisms for, for your livestock, have you done any economic studies which compare the, re, the cost of producing one compared to the cost of the other? And has the, has the differential in the end product been worth it? And why don't just cook it in olive oil, uh, grass fed in olive oil and you get the best results anyway? Okay, that is a, did you all hear that question? <laughs> Good, I'm just gonna sit down. <laughs> um, Economic, uh, well, let me put it this way. If, if uh, Americans thought it wasn't economically feasible, they wouldn't do it. Um, we're mass producing cattle the same way we mass started mass producing Fords because it's cheaper to actually have those in a feedlot where you can control the diet and control the, the health of the animal than doing grass fed. And so it actually, and if you look at the cost, I mean, I saw Australian grass fed beef and the cost of that versus the cost of, of your grain fed. So it is cheaper. Now, I'm not an economist, but I just, I'm, I'm falling back on, uh, people are in it to make money. Yeah, they love the cattle, they love that lifestyle, but um, if grain feeding didn't make sense, they wouldn't, and make them more money. The economics are there. And in fact, I have seen economics from Jason Sawyer that the longer or cattle are in the feedlot, the more money we make, which sounds counterproductive or intuitive, even when corn was really, really high. In fact, the fact that it was really high, they started making more money when they were able to get the feedlot, and um, US, USDA Choice and Prime gets way more money than Select, and, and it's hard to get uh, grass-fed cattle above Select. So um, I'm not an economist, but I just take the, the big picture and say, well, it, it's, if they're not making more money, 
then they'll, they'll leave them on pasture because we're very um, driven by the dollar. So. I, oh, and the, why not just cook it in olive oil? Well, I will tell you that um, my wife firmly believes we get too many N6 omega-6 fatty acids in the diet, and so we, she cooks in canola oil and olive oil. But that only covers the surface of the meat. It doesn't penetrate. So when it's all said and done, you still don't get the juiciness and flavor impact that you would get. This is a whole different. You might get the health benefits if you can coat it enough, but you won't get the same uh, organoleptic uh, sensation. So I was going to skip that, but you. <laughs> Matt. Absolutely. I'm just thinking, I think you're a lot about fatty acids and it's complicated which one's good for you, which one's bad. Yes. But in terms of bang for your buck, do you think if the small increase in those long-term fatty acids has the health benefit of that as opposed to a large increase in that acid? It's almost nil. Um, the recommendations in the United States for um, alpha-linolenic acid, which isn't the really good one, the good ones come from salmon or, or cold water fish, so alpha-linolenic acid, the recommendations for women is 1.6 grams per day, and for men it's 1.8 grams per day. Um, in a ground beef patty, we went, grain fed had 30 milligrams, or 0.03 grams, and the grain fed, a grass fed had 0.09 grams. So you want 1.6, 1,600 milligrams for a woman, and you're getting only 90? It, it's, <clears throat> it's, it, it just doesn't make any sense. Now some people, Jim Drewyard from Kansas State is feeding uh, flaxseed and getting those numbers higher, but then he has taste problems because they oxidize. You know, fish have a very strong smell because those fatty acids oxidize very readily. And do you know how to stop fish from smelling? Cut off their noses. Anyway. <laughs> I, was, I was headed that direction the whole time. <laughs> okay. I've had some wonderful beef in Australia. That's my polite answer. You know, we lived here for four <laughs> months, but the lamb was better. Um, well, we're Americans, and um, we've had horrible, horrible beef in Venezuela because it was grass-fed. I'm giving you negatives. We really like, um, we'll go to a restaurant. We eat steaks, but when we want a really good steak, we go to a high-end restaurant where they serve Angus that's USDA prime because it has enough marbling to be very juicy, and it's really hard to find a highly marbled steak that's also tough. So we're almost guaranteed that it's tender. Uh, but um, I won't eat a steak in Japan because it's too much fat, way too much fat. I'll just shabu shabu, little dice piece. It's really wonderful, but not as a steak. Oh, and I love Korean galbi. Oh, I almost forgot that. Um, is that on? Just uh, in regards to uh, marbling um, levels, I suppose, uh, you mentioned a lot about marbling, but what, what sort of levels of marbling are we talking? Are we talking, you know, nines or sevens or sixes? Or, you know, where, where are we talking in regards to, to your marbling outcomes? Okay, I don't, I don't, I know nines and sevens and sixes are probably meaningful. Let me talk in percentage of lipid, because, um, and, and maybe we can reconcile that. Yeah. Um, a USDA prime, and this is, Happy for you to talk in USDA. Okay, the uh, uh, if in prime it, it's uh, mod, uh, slightly abundant, and then we're talking about 12% lipid. Yeah. Our USDA choice ranges between five and seven percent lipid. You yeah. get down to select, it's you know three percent or three to five percent. Uh, if in the Japanese black, um, they have a minimum of about 30% lipid in the muscle. So the USDA prime is 12%, Japanese black 30% which is why I don't like, I couldn't eat a steak in Japan. They don't sell it that way anyway, but it's way too much fat. In, cor in terms of your numbering system, I, yes, I visited Australia. I should know this. I'm sorry, I don't. <laughs> and I suppose the second part to the question is, if we can get marble, higher marble scores off grass, is there an advantage in that area in regards to maybe higher levels uh, of uh, oleic, uh, oleic acid, or is it purely getting it from corn? Uh, no, that's a good question. Um, if you can get higher marbling, you are going to get more oleic acid. Because as fat cells develop and start to fill with lipid, part of the genetic programming is to turn on steroid desaturase activity. 
And the main reason for that is survival. The cells pr produce stearic acid, but its melting point is so high it will kill the cell. And so as they're cranking up more fatty acids, making more stearic acid to keep the fluidity for the membranes, they have to convert that to oleic acid with its lower melting point. So it's a survival. So if we, if we can have improved pastures that have nutritional levels which encourage, obviously along with the genetics, to get uh, those high levels of marbling, are we sort of working in the right areas or not? That's right, and I, a lot of folks, when I talk about grass-fed and grain-fed, they say, Where do you, where'd you feed them? Well, Central Texas, coastal Bermuda yeah. grass. They say, well, we have really improved pastures up in Idaho or something, and I say, well, then you're going to get a lot better results. So that's, I mean, through southern Australia, we're pretty lucky because we do get those higher, improved, better mm -hmm. nutritional pastures. So you know, we certainly get higher marble rates than what we see, you know, even out of feedlots here in Australia. Um, and my guess is that, uh, and I didn't learn this till I was here in, in the mid-90s, the relationship between marbling and fatty acid composition. We just weren't that far enough along. And it's not until I came here and we saw, I was going to, to um, uh, not ranches, stations, thank you, and, and uh, feedlots, and they said, we bought these Angus cattle from the U.S., got the embryos, we feed them for 300 days, they're not marbling. Oh, and by the way, and their fat's really hard and saturated, and that was the first clue I had there was a relationship between the two. So, okay, yeah. all right, thanks. All right. Well, thank you, I appreciate it.